Man, I like that one. That's a good song. Thank you, boys. I call them boys. I guess I'll call them boys forever. <laughs> well, I would invite you to open up your Bibles to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. So let me, uh, let me re recite something that you've heard before. Free at last. Free at last. Thank God Almighty, we're free at last. So Martin Luther King Jr. expressed those joyful words of freedom at the 1963 March on Washington for civil rights. And if you just listen to them or read them, those words convey more than freedom's joy. I think they hint at its long, hard struggle because he spoke those words a full century after liberty was first proclaimed to the African Americans in America. Free at last. I mean, it's like at last after centuries of bondage and enslavement. At last after another long century of prejudice and injustice. So slavery right here in America reminds us that freedom is not easily gained. And then once it's gained, it's easily lost. And that's, that's also true in the spiritual Realm. And that's why Dr. King borrowed those famous words from an old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty we're free at last. And you need to know that that song was talking about freedom from sin through Jesus Christ. So freedom in Christ, that was the Apostle Paul's main concern when he wrote this letter, Galatians, that we're studying through. And it's because the, the Galatians had gained freedom in Christ when they put their faith in Jesus Christ, Him crucified, Him risen from the dead. But then they fell under the spell of some teachers who wanted to add the law of Moses to the gospel of Christ. And they taught that Gentiles had to become Jews in order to become Christians. Basically, they, had, they meant that you had to follow all the dietary laws of the Old Testament, the ritual laws of the Old Testament, plus get circumcised. And so Paul could not come against them more strongly because Paul was what we would call a freedom fighter. He knew it was very easy for sinners like, like me and like you to just sort of enslave ourselves again in what's called works righteousness. We can really get caught up in moralism. Be a good person. God likes good people, right? Instead of embracing freedom. Freedom because of justification by faith alone. And so that kind of resets the stage for Galatians and for chapter 2. Paul is going to continue his personal testimony, just his autobiographical sketch here of his life of faith. And so this is chapter 2, and he's going to tell today about what we know today was just a momentous trip to the city of Jerusalem. And he met there privately with a handful of the most influential apostles in Jerusalem. And he went as a gospel freedom fighter. So verse 1 sets the stage. Let's just read that. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. And then he goes on from there in the next several verses to describe that meeting. We're going to look at it. I'm just going to kind of break it into four different parts to make it simpler to read and look at. The first part is Paul's fear, why he went. Verse 2, I went up because of a revelation. And set before them, though privately, before those who seemed influential, the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles, for fear that I might be running or had run in vain. So why did he go? Well, because of a revelation from God and for fear. And it's that last part. I think that should probably make us pause. Everything we know about Paul comes from the book of Acts and from his letters. And I want to tell you, the Paul we get to know was not a man given to fear at all. You think about it, Paul boldly destroyed the church before he got saved. And then Paul boldly preached the gospel after he got saved. Why would a man like Paul be so afraid? Well, he was just simply worried that his gospel mission work there in Galatia might be in vain. I think to a lot of us that grew up in the church, mission work kind of sounds exciting. You know, when I was a kid, I think missionaries came into churches more and it was my experience, usually they seemed old and boring to me. I'm just being honest. 
you know, and I look back on it and they're wonderful, but sometimes they weren't the best speakers. But I think we always were amazed and excited when they put pictures up. You know, I always love seeing pictures from Africa or from the Philippines or something like that. I think mission work sounds exciting. It has been my experience, though, the little bit of mission work that I've been a part of. It's just hard work, usually. Uh, you're away from all the comforts of home. You're away from your own home, your own bed, your own food, your own people. You're always around a bunch of people you don't know. You're, you're often doing hard, uncomfortable tasks. And you're always talking about the, the ultimate issues of life, the kind of stuff that people just don't like to talk about too much. Well, Paul did all that, all through this region of Galatia. And it's interesting, people responded in faith. Paul established churches all through that region. And then all of a sudden, some Jewish teachers from Jerusalem slipped in and told these young Christians, hey, Paul's gospel, that's not the whole thing. That's not the full gospel. That's not the gospel that the apostles back in Jerusalem are preaching. And, and that made Paul fearful because he knew that if the apostles in Jerusalem didn't confirm his message and didn't confirm, no, he's preaching the gospel. And if they didn't renounce all those false teachers, well, what that meant is that all those converts in Galatia, they would just return right back into slavery to sin. Just right back into man-made religion, do this, works righteousness, legalism, moralism. But I think there's a little bit more to Paul's fear than that. And let's just be honest here. I think he was a little bit leery of the apostles. And I'm talking about the apostles here, right? We're talking about the 12 that follow Jesus around. And they all still lived in Jerusalem. Paul's out here on the battleground. He's out there on the mission field. And I think he was a little bit worried that they might not be true to the one true gospel. They might not stand up to these Judaizers who were very influential men in Jerusalem. And they might allow all that Jewish cultural pressure, all the racial prejudice, to just entice them to let these false brothers into the church. And history proves that Paul's fears were well-founded. It's the apostle Peter. Peter, who was the spokesman, the leader. It turns out Peter did indeed cave in to that cultural racist pressure. In Jerusalem. You remember that he fell back into that clean Jew, dirty Gentile kind of a nonsense. And you might remember the story. Peter, at first, man, he got the gospel, right? He'd been trained by Jesus and he would eat dinner with dirty Gentiles who are now clean because of faith in Jesus Christ. And he'd have dinner. It doesn't seem like a big deal to us now. It was huge then. Right there in Jerusalem, he's eating with Gentiles who've been saved by their faith in Christ. And Peter did that until some real good friends of the Apostle James came into town. And that got Peter nervous. Oh, I don't, you know. And all of a sudden, when they're watching, he caved in to that cultural racial pressure. He wouldn't touch those dirty Gentile believers with a 10-foot pole. And Paul, Paul called him out on it. You know, history here in the American South is full of sad stories of Christian people bowing to racist pressure instead of bowing to King Jesus. You know, the 100 years of racial injustice leading up to Martin Luther King's famous speech and day, those, those 100 years should not have happened. You cannot believe how full of, of, of people those southern white churches were. I'm talking, southern people were going to church. Those churches were loaded up with white folks. White church people should have controlled southern culture. But guess what happened? Too many of them didn't do anything. They didn't stand up to the cultural racist, racist, racist pressure, or they just gave in to the racist hate, joined it. And I'll tell you, it's not easy today to stand for gospel truth in this age of lies that we live in. It's, in fact, it's getting more and more difficult because people want to make up their own good news today. Isn't that right? They don't want to be told that there's one way and only one way of salvation. And people put up with Christianity today really only so long as you mind your own business. Keep it to yourself. Keep it quiet. If that's what you want to do at home, if you want to just like tuck that away in a little corner of your little personal heart, that's fine. But shut your mouth and don't tell me what to do. And, and that's what's going on today. And so the church today is under great, great pressure to compromise our message, to lower it down, just to be more inclusive, right? But there's one thing that we can never give up. And that is the freedom that we have found in Jesus Christ. Salvation comes one way. And it is only because of Jesus' death and his resurrection. 
And so that's why Paul went to Jerusalem, just setting the stage for the meeting. That's why he went. He went to fight for freedom in Christ. So what was at stake? What was at stake? True church unity. So that's the second part of the meeting. So you got on one side of the dispute, Paul is saying the gospel of faith in Jesus Christ, it's for all people of all cultures. And then on the other side, his opponents claim, look, we know not all Jews are Christians, but all Christians have to become Jews. All of them have to become Jewish. That's what they said. Paul writes of the meeting, verse four, false brothers were secretly brought in. They slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus so that they might bring us into slavery. False brothers. Do you get that? The devil slipped his people right among the apostles. Right there with the apostles. Trusted by the apostles. The devil slips in his people right into the church today and they're often leaders. They're often often influential teachers and preachers. Paul calls them spies. That's an espionage term. You know, spies adapt themselves very cleverly to blend, to fit in with their enemies. Why? To strike a death blow. And the death blow in Galatia was to drag these Galatian converts back into slavery. So for them, it's no longer going to be free at last, free at last. What they wanted to do was to get these people to say, well, oh, wait a minute. You mean Paul's, I thought I was free. I'm not free? Well, Maybe I'm, maybe I'm not. I guess I'm not sure. You know, well, ha- have I done enough? Have I done enough to please God? Have I sinned too much? I'm still, still kind of doing some of that stuff Paul said that I've been forgiven for. Am I giving enough to the church? Maybe I'm not giving enough. I've never been on a mission trip. I still kind of like rock and roll music. Did they have that back then? And honestly, I don't, I don't really feel a lot of love for Jesus lately. I used to. I don't really feel it anymore. Do you get that? That bondage, slavery. And that's, that's what they were after. And so Paul meets with the apostles because he knows if they side with or even tolerate these false brothers, it is going to just split the church in two. Neither side is going to accept the other. And both is going to always question, well, you're not saved. Well, you're not saved. Well, you're not even real. Well, you're not real. And here we are, 2,000 years later, after Paul's freedom fighting meeting. And guess what? That battle is still going on. That battle is still raging. There are Pentecostals and Charismatics that will say that you aren't a Christian if you don't do what? Speak in tongues, right? Boy, boy, already, they're lobbing bombs at uh, us. There are entire denominations out there that will tell you, you can lose your salvation if what? Boy, if you keep sinning, you better, you know, And that's what always frightens me. I'm kind of like, well, how am I going to know? How do I know if I've sinned enough? You know, what do I have to do to make a loving God so mad at me that the death of his son is no longer sufficient to cover my sins? And you're constantly worried and you're constantly nervous. There are other influences out there in the church today. There's this new phrase. It's called, there's a hole in your gospel. You ever heard that one? There's a hole in your gospel. I don't really know what that means. Um, Sounds kind of dumb to me. But what they mean by that is, if you're not doing something to help people and you're not going somewhere, you've got a massive gaping hole in your gospel and you might not even have the gospel, therefore. All those are just modern perversions that come from false brothers who want to send freed people back into bondage. Do something, add something, or subtract something. Go somewhere, and above all, don't mess up. And this is why Paul, the freedom fighter, went to Jerusalem. He had to protect the gospel, or the church would just split into two, which is kind of what we see in our country today. So what did he find when he got there? What did he find among the apostles? And this is interesting. He just found found some wonderful men that had never left Jerusalem. It's like, there they were. They were Jews. They lived in Israel. Where was the first church? Jerusalem. That's where they went. And they were there. They never faced the implication of somebody else that wasn't Jewish. Somebody outside of Israel coming to faith in Christ. They just simply had not confronted the issue personally like Paul had. And so it was probably very natural for them to just think, well, yes, of course, all Christians should eat kosher, eat like Jews. It would be natural. All Christians should live kosher lives, live like a Jew. That's exactly what the false brothers were teaching. 
You know, Martin Luther writes about custom and tradition. Custom is of such force that it was not possible for the Jews who were newly converted to Christ suddenly to forsake the law. It's hard, in other words, for people, you and me, it's hard to reject opinions, traditions that we've held firmly culturally for a long time. But the ramifications of that mistake 2,000 years ago would be enormous if Paul lost that freedom fight because two, apart, two parties, again, two opposing parties would grow within Christianity. Both of them would be hostile to each other on this one fundamental point. Do we have to add some kind of an external behavior to our internal belief in Christ to be saved? So what was the verdict? What was the verdict? How, how did the apostles receive Paul? And so this is the third part of the meeting. And wonderfully, incredibly, the apostles welcomed Paul and his gospel. And their verdict really hinged on Paul's clever decision to bring Barnabas, who was his very good friend, and then Titus, who was like a son to Paul. So first, Barnabas. So Barnabas, uh, man, Barnabas, one, he's the kind of guy, and you love him. You trust him. You want to be like him. You, you respect him. I love the Barnabases of the family of God. They're solid. They're trustworthy. They, they are not... They're not look at me kind of people ever. They're always quietly, what can I do for you? That, that kind of person. Don't you love people like that? And they're usually quiet. They're always dependable. When they say something, you listen because they're not running their mouth too much. And so when they speak, you listen because you know it's true and it's trustworthy and it's from the heart. And if they say it, you believe it. And so here's the thing. Those apostles in Jerusalem, they knew Barnabas. And they knew his character. Barnabas, Paul brings him with him. Barnabas had been out there. Unlike those apostles who never left Jerusalem, Barnabas had been out there on the mission field. And he preached freedom from slavery to the law to Gentiles. Barnabas could personally attest. He saw it with his own eyes. Former pagans repenting of their sins and placing their belief in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul, Barnabas saw the Holy Spirit given supernaturally, spiritually to these Gentiles. He attested to the fact that Jesus was transforming their lives. They were leaving their lives of sin behind. They were worshiping the one true God. And here's the thing. All of that, all of that was going on without them becoming Jews without living kosher lives, without getting circumcised. And so Barnabas's just personal testimony there at that meeting must have been a tremendous persuasive influence on the apostles. But it's Titus who's the key. Titus, and you got to see this. Titus is standing there, young man, in Jerusalem. He's in the holy city of God. And he's not Jewish. He's standing there flesh and blood, uncircumcised Gentile. You can't, I mean, if anything was going to enrage the Judaizers, it was bringing an uncircumcised man into the holy city. You have to understand circumcision meant everything. It represented everything to the Jews. It, it was the sacred mark of Jewish identity. It was the symbol of salvation ever since the days of Abraham. The removal of the male foreskin, that was the visible sign of belonging to God's people. And so if a Gentile, all through the Old Testament, if a Gentile was going to become a Jew, he had to be circumcised. That's what the law said. And then along comes Paul and starts preaching this law-free gospel. None of that other stuff like circumcision. He preached the good news of the cross and the empty tomb. And he said that, oh, what about the law? What about circumcision and everything else? Let me tell you what about that, he said. Jesus Christ fulfilled every single rule, regulation, law, do this, don't do that. Jesus fulfilled every single bit of it. So circumcision doesn't even matter anymore. And Paul preached the only thing that it takes for a sinner like you or you or me to belong to God is to put our faith in Jesus Christ and what he did for us, what he did for us. That's why there can't be a hole in your gospel. The gospel isn't even yours. It's not mine. What is the gospel? It is Jesus Christ living a perfect life, dying on the cross, being placed into a tomb and being raised to newness of life. That's the gospel. Those are historical facts, the facts that God used to save a sinner like you and me. So the gospel isn't yours or mine to even poke a hole in. 
It's what Jesus did for you. And so Paul walks into this meeting with Titus. He's the perfect test case for freedom, for the freedom of the gospel. Because he's a man who received Jesus Christ as his Lord or Savior. And so here becomes the question. Here's Titus. Paul just said, you know, guys, I'd like you to meet Titus. And basically, here's what he's saying. You tell me. You tell him. You tell him. Does he have to do anything more than repent of his sins and place his belief in your Messiah, God? Does he have to do anything more than that? I mean, does he have to? Are you going to make him be circumcised? Are you going to make him start eating weird Jewish stuff that he's never had in his life? I mean, is that, is that what you're saying? You, you tell me. You guys... You're the ones that followed Jesus around for three years. You're the one that learned the gospel from him. You tell me. And I don't care about all these false brothers in here, these spies in here. What do you guys say about Titus? He's standing right here. And the answer that the apostles gave is that Titus did not have to be circumcised. As Paul put it, verse 3, even Titus who was with me was not forced to be circumcised, though he was a Greek. I tell you, church, that's a victory. It's one of the biggest victories in the history of the church. The apostles sided with Paul and his gospel. Paul writes, verse 9, when James, and he just cites some of the few that were there, when James and Cephas, that's Peter and John, who seemed to be the pillars, when they perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me. I love that, the right hand of fellowship. This comes right from the Bible. That is a very ancient expression of common agreement survives to this very day. When somebody gets saved today and they join a church like ours, the pastor like me just introduces this brand new brother or this brand new sister and they say, church, come down and do what? Give them the right hand of fellowship. It just means they're one of us now. And they're, they have been freed, free at last, free at last. We've got a brother or a sister that has been freed from the bondage of sin because of their faith in Jesus Christ. And church, and so, and, and I might do it today. I invite you guys to come down here. Here's the little brother standing right here. And I want you to come give the right hand of fellowship. Because we're one in Christ. We're family now. We are one in the body of Christ. We believe one gospel. We believe one baptism, one Christ, one faith. Now, here's the thing about circumcision. Not only is it weird to talk about it, it's like not even a hot topic to talk about today. If it wasn't in the Bible, I wouldn't be wanting to talk about it. You know, Certainly not a hot topic, but here's the thing. It... It just represents what is still a very deep, alive issue. It's just law keeping. Law keeping. So Paul's victory that day, I think, has nothing to really do with circumcision. It's what it represents. And it's why his victory that day teaches three, what I would just call timeless lessons about gospel freedom. Very quickly, number one, this. There, there's no second class Christians. None. How could there be? Every Christian is saved exactly the same way. Exactly. By grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Paul writes in Romans, For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in God's sight. Now, the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. So God doesn't save great law keepers any faster than he saves great law breakers. And he doesn't love Christians in one church or one denomination more than he does in others. So I spent almost my whole life in the church, way more often than I would like it to be the case. Way too often, I run across modern day Judaizers and, and they feel like they're superior to me. You ever felt that from church people? Usually they're from another church, another denomination, another movement. And, and it's been my experience, because I'm a lifelong Baptist, um, and, and, and I have been made in many people, and it's funny, they laugh. Well, where do you go to church? Uh, such and such Baptist. Oh, you're Baptist. And then you get that. Oh, you're, you're Baptist. And I have been made many times to feel like they're superior to me because I'm Baptist and I'm not whatever they are. Like, like I didn't get as much Holy Spirit than them, right? Oh, you just got a little bit of the Spirit and we got the whole gospel. I mean, there's even a group out there called Full Gospel. You ever heard that? They're the Full Gospel. Well, we Baptists are, I mean, maybe not even half, an eighth, I don't know. Oh, that's silly. I mean, Full Gospel? Let me tell you, we're Full Gospel right here. There's only one gospel, you know what I mean? And you don't have to do anything. You don't have to, you don't have to speak in tongues. We don't have to have a Jericho march seven times around the inside and dance and shout. We don't have, nothing, I'd be happy to see some of that, but we don't have to do it. Um, there's one gospel. 
And there's one church. There's no second class Christians. That's what I'm saying. Secondly, therefore, there can be no discrimination in the church. A church can't exclude people from salvation based on anything, race, gender, class, age, anything. So you've heard me talk about Tulsa Together, uh, that organization here in town is founded on this gospel lesson. Tulsa Together exists because Sunday morning, this hour right now, is the most segregated hour in the week. You ever thought about that? There are black people worshiping somewhere over there. There's brown people over there. There's red, yellow people. And then we white people, well, here we are. I mean, it's the most segregated hour. Isn't that weird? So I've been to a couple of the Tulsa Together worship services, and I'll tell you, I'll just tell you what I would wonder, I'm just being honest. If, if I was a person of color at the, the joint services I've been to, here's what I would wonder. Where are all the white people? Where's all the white people? Because the people of color are there wondering where we are. And I wonder if our absence sends an elitist message that there are second-class Christians. And there is discrimination in the church. So I was the only white minister on stage at the recent communion service. A bunch of black men, me. So my family and three dear people, white people, from here at our church, we're the only white people in the crowd. That's it. Had we, and I, thought, I thought, had we not been there, there'd be no white people. And I even wonder, well, where were you? You made a choice, just like you do. All of you all make choices, just like I do. You made a choice to not go that night, just like every other white church member in Tulsa who was invited. And the choice to not go, I'll tell you, it sent a message that I would suppose they heard loud and clear. It's basically, you're still second class. <laughs> We're, we don't need to go to that. You know, you people of color can get together. We don't need to be there. We don't care. I want to tell you about someone whose presence sent a powerful message. And Kyle, I know I'm going to embarrass you now. Kyle will be the last guy that wants me. Everybody look at Kyle Green. Kyle, I'm going to make you wave your hand, Kyle. Wave at the church. That's about as much as you're going to get out of Kyle on this. Kyle went. Um, so the service was just about to begin, and I'm sitting on stage with the black ministers. When the leader of Tulsa Together, called, I could see him calling somebody out there, and it looked at me like he was pointing at Kyle. I think Kyle thought, why is he pointing at me? You know, I got Kyle looking left and looking right. And finally, Kyle realizes he's talking to me, and he's, he's you know, Come here, you know, we're up on stage. And uh, so he calls Kyle out of the crowd, and, and I'm thinking to myself, well, what in the world? I mean, does Reverend Casey know Kyle? I can't imagine, you know, the connection. And they talk for a little bit. Of course, I can't hear it. I'm nosy, but I can't, like, what are they, you know. And I can't hear what they're talking about. And, uh, and then Kyle goes back to his seat. Reverend Casey sits down and whispers to the black ministers on stage who Kyle was. And I'm with them, and I'm watching. I'm telling you, it was like a, a, a ripple effect. Every minister to a man beamed, smiled. Well, I'm really curious. I'm like, what in the world is Kyle doing? You know, did he slip a million dollars into the plate? You know, um, and I'm wondering it. And so I, I asked Reverend Casey, I'm like, do you know Kyle? And you'd have to know Reverend Casey. He's got this dramatic way. He says, I don't know him, but I know his grandfather. And he said it just, I know his grandfather. And I still, Kyle, I'm going to have to get more of this. I don't know the whole story on his grandfather. But man, I know this. He was a minister and a missionary who served right there with African-American brothers and sisters in North Tulsa. Right there with them. And whatever he did, and I still don't know the story and I want to get it. But I'm telling you, he earned the respect and the love of every preacher on stage that night. I've never seen such a loving or such loving respect just visibly shown on men's faces. Uh, and some of them didn't even know his grandpa. They just knew of him. And it, it was still, and I, Kyle, I wish I'd known the man. Uh, but here's the thing. Kyle's decision to go that night speaks volumes about his Christian character. Because he went out of respect for the fact that his grandfather embraced discrimination-free Christianity, right? He went to show that he embraces a church where there's no second-class citizens. He didn't have to go that night any more than you didn't go. He went to send a message. Because he knew that his absence would send a message. He knew his presence would send a message. And his presence sent a warm, loving, powerful message that I know every black man in that crowd appreciated that night. They received it that night. I think that's beautiful. 
Let me mention one more timeless lesson from Paul's freedom fighting victory in Jerusalem. And it's this, a little different angle. There's no relative righteousness in the church. And here's what I mean. Church people, we are notorious for ranking sins. We do it. So if someone here among us struggles with pride, if someone here among us struggles with anger, that is easy. I mean, who does it? Would you pray for me? I mean, my anger, I've got anger issues, but I'm dealing with pride. I'm dealing with what, you know, and boy, those are just easy. I mean, who doesn't struggle with that kind of stuff? But somebody who's battling depression, somebody whose marriage is falling apart, somebody who's, a, who's tempted to commit homosexual sin, somebody who's addicted to drugs. Well, you better keep that stuff quiet, you know. We don't want to hear it because otherwise people are going to know. If you start talking about that kind of stuff, we're all going to know you don't really belong. There's something wrong with you. You don't really. It's back to that ranking. And we, we've got this relative righteousness. And that is the way that many Christians think. But I want to tell you that is not the way God thinks. That's not the way God thinks at all. Now, we all face different trials, temptations. But there's no difference in our standing before God. And I just want to say it, if there's no difference in our standing before God, well, there should be no difference in our standing with each other at all, right? So I don't know, obviously, I don't know what your personal struggles involve, but you're my brother and you're my sister, so I don't care. In fact, don't be afraid to ask for help from me, from some solid brother or sister here at our church. I, I'm, Kind of a reality check. Are we not supposed to be God's family? I mean, aren't, aren't we God's family? Aren't we supposed to love each other because of God's great love for us through Jesus? I mean, I, so let's stop nodding, just nodding our assent to truths like that and start living like we actually believe it. Let me close out Paul's meeting with the fourth and final part, the outcome. And the outcome was freedom. Freedom. Paul argued that the false brothers wanted to make us slaves. They wanted to prevent the Galatians and Paul from enjoying the freedom we have in Christ Jesus. He's basically saying that the gospel gives freedom. While his opponents and their earn your salvation message, that just leads people right back into slavery. The whole meeting was about freedom. So, as we close, how does the gospel provide freedom? How? Two ways. There's just two that I'll mention. First, the gospel leads to what I call cultural freedom. Cultural freedom. So here's the thing. Legalistic churches, moralistic churches, they, they really exert a lot of pressure on their members with these very specific rules, very specific regulations for everything, from how you dress, daily behavior. Maybe you grew up in a, in a setting like that. Maybe you grew up in a church or a denomination. It was very, very controlling. The culture is always controlling. And why is it? Have you ever wondered, why are those churches so controlling? It's simple. If your salvation depends on obeying rules, well, then your rules need to be what? Very specific. you got to know what they are. Very doable. you got to be able to do them because you want to go to heaven and not hell, right? And they got to be very clear. And if you went to a church like that, it's, very, it's like that. So here's what you don't want. You don't want to hear Jesus saying, love your neighbor as yourself. Love your enemy. You don't want to do that because that's, that's like an impossibly high standard. I can't love my neighbor like myself. I don't want to love my enemies. I mean, the, the, the implications of that from the Lord Jesus, well, they're endless and I don't like that. Here's what you want. And here's why these churches exist. You want, don't go to movies. It's very clear, very specific, very doable. You know, you don't have to go to a movie. And then you can feel really good before God. I haven't gone to a movie in 28 years. Well, you're boring. You know? <laughs> I mean, you want things like that. Don't drink this. Don't eat that. You know? Don't dress this way. Don't wear your hair that way unless it's a big bun hairdo. Where are all the ladies with the big bun hairdos? You, know? um, you see, those rules and those regulations, they work their way into just daily cultural life. And what happens is those churches really, they end up with sort of a, a, a cultural ghetto Christianity. It's our own little ghetto. Well, that's, what we, that's what we've got here in America now. Every little subculture just kind of tucked itself away into its own little religious ghetto. You think about Paul's opponents. If they had won at the meeting that day in Jerusalem, that means if there was an Italian or an African, well, they couldn't become a Christian unless they became 
culturally Jewish, right? Got to eat kosher, dress kosher, live kosher, all that kind of stuff. And if they refuse to do that, well, what, well, the only thing they could do is just move off into a little cultural ghetto in some little city. Well, we're not real Christians. We're Italian Christians or we're, we're African Christians. And really, that's what's happened in America, but not just ethnically. There are entire denominations. There are non-denominational movements that have created their own brand of the gospel, their own rules, their own regulations. And they're out there pressuring their members in a very legalistic way of living. And each little group is convinced that their message is the true gospel. And they're always suspicious of people like us or anybody else. Well, your fault. You don't have it all. You don't have all the ghosts. You don't have all the gospel. And it has divided the church. It's enslaved people. And, and it's simple. What the church needs is the true gospel that frees people to just follow Jesus Christ. Second, finally, the gospel leads to emotional freedom. If you believe that your relationship with God is based on keeping up some really ritualistic and rugged and, and just tight little moral behaviors, if you're convinced that that's what it's all, then I just tell you, you are on an endless treadmill that's going to lead to guilt, insecurity. As I said earlier, you never know when it's enough. When have you done so much bad that now you're off the treadmill altogether and on your way to hell again? I don't want you to misunderstand me. We Christians are commanded to obey God's laws. If I don't, don't, I'm not, so all this talk about freedom doesn't mean just go off and do anything you want. So in other words, we're, we're not supposed to lie. We're not supposed to steal. We're not supposed to commit adultery. We're not supposed to do a lot of things. And we're supposed to, on the positive side, to do a whole bunch of things, right? So we're certainly not free from God's moral code as a way to live our lives. But we are definitely free from God's moral code as a way to earn our salvation. We don't have to earn our salvation because who did it all already? Who's the one that met all of the requirements of the law? Jesus Christ did. So Christian, let me just say to you, you don't have to obey God's laws out of fear. You don't have to be obedient out of a sense of insecurity, hoping to earn your salvation. You can just live an obedient life, yes, but in the freedom of security of knowing that you're already saved. Gospel freedom. So two things in closing. Sinner. Come out of slavery to sin. Embrace the free grace that God offers through faith in Jesus. Because you stand condemned right now. You are under the condemnation of a holy, righteous God right now. He cannot stand sin, yours or mine. So you're condemned right now. Why not receive the rescue and salvation that he offers? He offers only through justification in Jesus Christ. Just free grace. Or maybe you're already saved, but you kind of re-enslaved yourself. You got into moralism. You got into legalism. You got into denominationalism. You got into judgmentalism. And you've been trying to earn what God only gives and only God can give through free grace. So just come and repent of that and embrace the peace that comes through Jesus Christ. I would invite you to stand to your feet, please, as we pray. God, thank you for the gospel. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for Paul, a freedom fighter, a man just willing to stand up against the preeminent apostles. He himself was an apostle, and, and yet he was willing to risk excommunication, I guess. I just... And here we are all these years later, Lord, struggling with the same things. God, just help us embrace your salvation through your Son. And we pray in his name. Amen.